welcome back to Honor Health. We have in the cath lab with us today, Denise, Anne, and Katie. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to have my young partner uh, with me who's going to lead us through this case, Alok Sharma. And over on uh, transesophageal echocardiography is going to be Dr. Robert Burke. And we're also pleased to have our uh, extraordinary uh, cardiac anesthesiologist, Robert Schwartzstein. So I'm going to just turn this over to you and uh, have you uh, take us through the case. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, I'm going to introduce the case here. Uh, she's a 79-year-old female, has a history of permanent atrial fibrillation. Her chad vasc score is about 5 with an annual stroke risk, which is 7.2%. Her risk of stroke or TIA or systemic embolism is about 10%. Her has blood score is three, which uh, equates to 3.7% risk of bleeding. She does have a prior history of GI bleed uh, requiring one unit of packed RBCs and a prior history of ga gastric bypass surgery and a recent uh, 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 endoscopy and colonoscopy confirmed uh, small uh, AVMs, and she has chronic anemia, uh, along with type 2 diabetes and hypertension. So the plan today is to do a Watchman uh, left atrial appendage occlusion device with either a 27 millimeter or a 30 millimeter device based on the pre-procedure TEE. Uh, she, we did do a shared decision making, uh, which was done by the primary cardiologist, and. Uh, uh, we are doing the watchman because of her inability to take long-term anticoagulation in the setting of prior GI bleed, AVMs, and chronic anemia. So, you guys, uh, does this sound, uh, any, any comments after the uh, clinical presentation? No, I, I was just going to say, David, uh, that it's just right on label. You know, right. Chad's right. fast, three or more, good reason uh, to not be able to take long-term anticoagulation, but somebody that's certainly in those first six weeks probably going to be able to tolerate warfarin. Right. Okay, so uh, you want to show them what you have so far? So, uh, so these are the baseline T images done by Dr. Burke a few weeks ago. Uh, so you can see th this is 0 degree, 45, 19, 135 degree views. Uh, go to the next slide. These were the baseline measurements. Uh, so we have adequate depth on these uh, T images. Uh, the widest measurement at the Austin was about, uh, I think, 2. And uh, the depth was about, I think, 27 millimeters, if I can read it from here. Uh, and uh, go to the next slide. Uh, Dr. Burke does this, uh, the osteo measurement, like really well. And based on his baseline TEE, he measured it about uh, 2.4 to 2.0 uh, 2 centimeter uh, and with a, a perimeter of about uh, 70 millimeters. So, uh, Bob, I'm going to uh, go to you for the uh, T images are what you got today. Okay, so with our T images today, we started off again going through baseline screening. There was some concern that uh, she does have some spontaneous echo contrast, and we chased that around to make sure that there was no evidence of an actual thrombus. As you can see, the measurements are pretty consistent with what we had had before. And we also went into a 3D, uh, which you can see that there's the circumflex coming around through here on our 3D imaging. We use that as a marker to determine where we are with regard to the actual os of the left atrial appendage. And we did a regular scan through the uh, rest of the heart, making sure there were no surprises. And basically, we're still sticking with the same uh, device size as what we had had previously. There was a little concern for uh, possible PFO, which was actually not flow patent, but you never know if it's going to be pro patent, that uh, Dr. Sharma had to manage as part of our transeptal. He was able to go through the transeptal, though, with no difficulty. You can see he's up here in the SVC, coming across, end up coming down. He's nice and low and posterior with his tent. And you can see that he punctures nicely with a very low and posterior site. So we have adopted uh, really the same philosophy on this that Yakubov and Herms have, and that is we generally uh, uh, burn through, we do an RFA through there. Uh, oftentimes we'll use uh, the, Bayless, uh, the Bayless wire. Uh, we've just kind of adopted that philosophy, and I, I think a lot of that's because you guys have influenced us on that, Herms and Yak. Uh, yeah. I David, I'm, I'm just going to, uh, just a second, your left atrial pressure, how high? So, uh, yeah, I'm going to walk you guys through that. 
So uh, I want to pay attention to the groin here. Uh, if somebody can focus the camera here. I usually uh, do th uh, the watchman from 16 French cook sheets. So I have two uh, pre-close uh, sutures. I usually do one, but uh, today I decided to do two uh, because now it's uh, indicated for venous punctures. Right. Uh, so I have an SL0 uh, sheath for my uh, transeptal. And her right atrium was a little big, so I used a C1 needle with a little bit bigger curve uh, 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 for that. She does have some scoliosis, so which most of the time makes the transeptal a little challenging. So if you look at the fluoro now, this is my uh, wire in the SVC. Uh, so you go with uh, the SL0 sheet, and you pull back, uh, clocking it, and you see a jump, and that's uh, usually in the fossa right there. And uh, this is uh, the transeptal puncture. And after that, I use a 032 wire, yes, no, thing, thing. which usually goes into the left superior pulmonary vein mm -hmm. if you clock it into the left atrium. And this is a 032 wire into the pulmonary vein. And if you pay attention, if the wire goes outside the, the cardiac shadow, that's usually in the, uh, the pulmonary vein. And, uh, this and then we advanced uh, uh, the sheath into the, uh, the left atrium and then measured the left atrial pressure. Her mean left atrial pressure was about 20. She does have some MR uh, and uh, some probably some diastolic dysfunction with a non-compliant left atrium with the V-way, which is about uh, like 30 millimeters. So the left atrial pressure was pretty good. Yeah, that, that's, that's plenty high. I was just going to ask Steve and Bridge, you know, where do you go? I heard Steve yesterday you say, you're sort of mid-mid. Are you, you know, I, I tend to be low and posterior like this, but I'd love to hear what your comments are. Well, we used to always strive for inferior and posterior, but I think over time we've just kind of accepted mid-mid or inferior posterior. I, I think that the positioning of the transeptal puncture, although it's nice to be precise on these, it doesn't matter quite as much as if you're doing, say, um, mitral clip or if you're going to go do a mitral valve and valve. But I think if you, it all depends. The, the key is to be as safe as possible. I would take inferior posterior every time if I could, but I'm happy to take mid-mid. The only other comment I would make is I, I quit going out into the left pulmonary superior uh, uh, pulmonary vein with wires, and so typically with the bailus wire, I would use a right. the I would use or with the bailus needle, I would typically use the protract wire just because it provides adequate stiffness, and we would typically go right up with the uh, with the watchman guide rather than having a sheath in place. Yeah, we, we are a small community hospital. We, we cannot afford bailus wire. <laughs> <laughs> Only for mitral clips, right, Hermes? So, uh, so this is my, uh, I'm using a double curved uh, uh, sheath here uh, to cross the septum. And we, then we go into the right uh, areocaudal view, uh, which is usually the deployment view. And this is my pigtail going into the left atrial appendage. So you just advance the pigtail and counterclock it. It usually goes into the uh, left atrial appendage, uh, and this is the baseline uh, uh, angio we took. Now, it really is not too consistent with what we saw on the TEE. So, uh, does the panel want to comment on the the uh, like anatomy of this left atrial appendage and what would be the the strategy for the the watchman device here? Bridge, Bridge, you want to comment? So, you know, we see this more and more often that, you know, you see something else on transesophageal echocardiography and then suddenly you do an, an LA angiogram and everything looks very different as what you're seeing here. So this is not uncommon, first of all. Uh, secondly, you know, what, uh, what you guys just showed us with the three uh, multiplanar reconstructions, I think that's the best way of measuring it. Because if you're looking at your two-dimensional sizing, it was smaller, but on multiplanar reconstruction, you are almost up to 2.47 which is probably what the actual dimension of this appendage is. So multiplanar reconstruction, I think, is a better way of doing it. Now, the other thing also which is important is uh, the way your catheter is sitting, you are going to be cantilevered, and you are going to need to be very anterior if you, are not, if you do not want a shoulder. So in this case, I think a double curve is, is a good uh, sheet to use. But I think the key in this case really is to understand is that traditionally, you always learn to 0, 45, 90, 135 degrees. 
and we take that as God's gospel truth, we really need to move away from that and start doing multiplanar reconstruction because that is truly what the exact dimension of the appendage is, or the author of the appendage is. Yeah, so I think that's a good question. Uh, now, a lot of centers do uh, pre-procedure CT imaging. Is, is that what most people are doing these days? Because we, I agree with you, most of the time, the TE and the angiogram uh, do not correlate uh, at all. So the issue with CT that I've had is, is twofold. On a lot of times on CT, until and unless you truly have a good CT guru, and you really know as to where your watchman device or amulet is going to sit, you can be in a wrong spot and measure differently. So we've had situations where we've measured small, measured large. Now on echocardiography, I know how my watchman is going to sit, and I can recreate my multiplanar view in such a fashion that I will be at the spot where I'm going to measure. Now, as we get more facile with CT and geography, I think that will be the way to do it. Yeah. Uh, but as of right now, for where we stand, I think 3D echo with multiplanar reconstruction, in my viewpoint, is a better option. Great. Yeah, so, so now, uh, should we stick with our plan to do a 27 uh, device here? Or should we, uh, I mean, the problem is going to be, if I use a bigger device, there's going to be a bigger posterior shoulder here. I have to go into the anterior lobe uh, to actually uh, be more coaxial. Uh, so, you know, w what I would do in this case is try and get your guide as safely as possible, as distally as possible first. And then you make your decision as to how big or small of a device you want to put. Again, keep in mind that on multiplanar reconstruction, your dimension was 2.47. Your compression is going to be marginal, and if you're sitting ever so slightly cantilevered in a couple of views, you may actually be less than 8%. So yeah. I personally would say if you can potentially get a 30 millimeter, I would put a 30 millimeter device in this place. Yeah, I know. So that's why I think b even based on the pre-procedure TE, I was debating whether 27 or 30. Uh, that's why I put it in my first slide. Now, this is the the maximum I can advance my pigtail and the shear. I mean, I can go a little bit, two more millimeter uh, deeper. But if you look at the markings, I'm, I mean, it's like m maybe like 27. I, I th I'm going to struggle with uh, depth for a 30 millimeter device here. I'll, uh, I'll just give you a couple of comments here. First of all, um, we talk about measuring these with CT and uh, TE imaging. And I believe that CT imaging really is by far the best strategy. Having said that, we never do it, just because um, of the contrast to the patient, the inconvenience to the patient, and probably the lack of indication at this point in time to do the test. I, I like the TE image to help me land the device. I hardly ever trust the numbers adequately, and I don't think that you should discount what your angiogram shows you. If you use the guide as, your, as, as about 4.5 millimeters, you know this device is at least 30. Right. So the real issue here is how are you going to keep the anterior torque on your guide? And you should deploy this from the anterior lobe. Right. So you want to get this guide up into the anterior lobe. I think you have plenty of length to land the 30s device adequately. And I do think the 27 will be too small. All right, well, let's yeah. get to it. All right, so I'm going to try to get my pigtail in, uh, into the anterior superior lobe and see if I can advance my uh, guide in a little bit deeper. So I'm going to counterclock my guide here. And can you test here for me, please? Okay. And if you guys can open a 30 millimeter device, that would be great. Test here for me. So I'm counterclocking it and advancing it gently over the sheath here, or over the pigtail. Right. You're making nice pro progress here. So I'm like really counterclock here. So uh, I'm going to try to take an angio here. Wow. All right. So I'm going to try to advance it like maybe like a millimeter or more so, and then uh, try to deploy a 30 millimeter device. Yeah. You can prep the device. I think you're plenty far yeah, right there. I, I think you're going to be just be fine. If you felt yeah. uncomfortable at all, you could prep the device so that the feet are peeking out just a bit. Yeah. But you, you have plenty of room right now. Right.
Lock, how, how much anterior torque you got on that? So, Nine you know, o'clock? I'm at like around 10 o'clock. Okay. In these instances, it's nice to have somebody else like uh, prep the device, get it ready to go while you hold your catheter in place. Because these guide catheters don't want to stay exactly where they are. So I like how you have your hand totally on the catheter the whole time. You know, one of the things that you could do is on a T, you can measure as to how much guide you have inside the appendage. That's, that's a cool trick to do. So that will also tell you how much of a landing zone you actually have. He does have the markers, almost the last marker, into the off, so I think he's got yep. plenty of room now. Yep. And like on T, it looks very nice. It's very anterior. It looks pretty decent there. This is a quick point on that TE because it demonstrates so I, you can see the guide catheter hugging the right side of this appendage. That's the anterior lobe. If, you, if that guide catheter is moving more toward the left, it's the posterior lobe. The device will um, angle itself totally differently whichever lobe that you're put in. If you're in the posterior lobe, the shoulder tends to poke out near the uh, circumflex uh, um, artery near the mitral valve a little bit too much, and that's why we typically choose the anterior lobe as the lobe of uh, deployment. So, Anne, are we ready? Bridge, could you maybe comment on uh, sort of the, the while well they were prepping some of the evolution and the technique you know, multiple flushes, using a pigtail catheter. When we first started this 10 years ago during the trials, this is not the way this uh, procedure was performed, but it really has evolved. Yeah, I mean, if, if I go back to 2005, uh -huh. it, it, you know, this, what we were doing in 2005 was truly voodoo in my mind. And, you know, as uh, Steve just pointed out, uh, the, uh, the right side of the screen on that 135 degree angle is the anterior lobe. Uh, we had no clue about that, that that was the anterior lobe. We did not know anything about the inferior, posterior, uh, superior part of the septum. We would just stick the septum wherever, whenever we could do it. Uh, there was only one angle guide that was a single curve, which pretty much we never use anymore, very rarely. Um, so that, that was from a uh, device perspective. The device was much longer than what it is. So if you guys think the device is long now, well, wait a minute, it was much longer before. Um, so and not only from that perspective, but the issues also were from a flushing perspective. Uh, we were not as anal as we are right now. And what I've done is I don't take a syringe and flush the catheter now. I connect it to a so pressure bag. Can you hold respiration? And uh, it works very nicely. Because that way, there's a continuous flush. You're not disconnecting the flush from time to time. Alex, that was a beautiful technique there where you kept the... Uh, the guy torqued into the um, anterior lobe while you remove the pigtail. That's not always easy because the guide catheter sometimes wants yeah. to move. So uh, I'm going to hold the respirations Air here. And, and uh, then I'm going to snap this thing together. And uh, then slowly d deploy this under Swinney. <coughs> can breathe now. So that I'm gonna looks, have that pretty good. I'm gonna have Dr. Burke interrogate before I do the tug test, and then uh, we'll see. So when when I'm releasing this, you have to put a little bit of uh, just a forward uh, pressure, not pushing it, but just gentle forward pressure, uh, so that it doesn't pop back out. Uh, so Bob, would you, for those that don't necessarily do this procedure or see this procedure every day? Would you go through meticulously what, what you're looking for in the compression testing? So again, we're going to have to go through past criteria. We're going to have to measure the size of the device as it's inside the uh, left atrial appendage and make sure that it has adequate compression. I don't think that we're going to have trouble with that. The other concern that we're going to have is whether or not there's any color flow around the device. As you can see here, it actually looks pretty good. The uh, Use of 3D is nice because we can also get the basic measurements on 3D just like we would on 
regular 2D. So I'll get out of this though just to show standard biplane stuff that most people are more comfortable imaging. And throw some color on here just to see is there any evidence at all of any color flow. And so far we're not seeing anything. I'll drop the Nyquist limit down just to make sure that we're not being fooled. And as it stands that still looks very good. Come back down around to our 0 and 90 just to make sure we don't have any surprises there. These are the measurements that we typically make, again, as part of uh, standard criteria. Have a little bit of a shoulder there, but uh, we would anticipate that given the size of the device and the depth that we had. But I'm really not seeing anything too worrisome. Looks like the flow, there's no color flow around that. And again, I dropped the Nyquist limit down to 40 so that we're really not gonna fool ourselves That looks terrific by, by those echo views. It, nice, it would be nice, Bob, if you could show us the on FOSS view also. But I have to tell you, the, um, you have a little bit of the shoulder sticking out posteriorly, but that's, uh, that's terrific. It would have been, um, you have great compression, it looks like, both on echo and both angiography. The angiographic appearance shouldn't be discounted. You know, you want to see that compressed strawberry look in the, in the, uh, in the appendage from, from the device. So again, we're looking really good even at uh, the 45, 135. And as far as any color flow, we're not seeing any there. And we can go back into our 3D view here and pop into more of our on FOSS. Coming back up. Spin that around for you. And again, looking at the device looks like it's hanging out very nicely seated inside there. So what I also do is I, I measure the uh, Watchman device in that quad screen that Jerry and Bob and, and, and bring your uh, multi-plane onto the, uh, the crown itself and that gives rise to a, a very nice view that you can actually measure. So there's several things we can do. Now we're in 45 as our horizontal plane here. This is going to be a 135 as a result. So as I bring this around, I can optimize both of those views pretty quickly rather than trying to hunt and get into appropriate biplane view. And then we can make those measurements off of the 3D pretty quickly here. So it looks like we're doing pretty well. We've got about a 25 there, which is nicely compressed, and that's at 45. If we flip over here to the 135. Again, we can make our measurements. Again, we've got just about a 24 and a half. Not looking too bad there. So we will need to make sure that we're anchored okay and we have our tug test. Yeah, so I'm going to do a tug test here. Uh, so pull the sheet back and uh, so I mean you can see that the whole appendage moves and then when it releases it goes back into. So I think it's a good tug test. Right. Uh, I'm going to take an angio and then uh, I'll and you can see on angio, it, it, uh, it's adequately compressed you, uh, based on just the, the angiographic uh, picture. Uh. Yeah, th the appearance just looks uh, ideal. As, as Steve said, you know, it looks like a strawberry. So it's nicely compressed, and I, you know, I think it's going to look very good. And your tug test is very stable. Alec, I don't think you could have done this any better. Uh, you had the guide buried as far as you can. You picked the right device. You have the you have the right orientation. You, this is just really elegant. You did an awesome job. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think I was going to go with 27, so that's why I think doing live cases is even uh, educational for me because uh, I would actually have gone with the 27, but I mean, thanks to you guys that uh, you guys convinced me to put a 30 millimeter device, and I think that was the right thing to do here.
Those are, those are some of the things from like live cases that I've picked up over time. I think Bridge has been very, um, he's been very instrumental, at least in some of my thinking on sizing, because he's always used larger devices as a, as a routine. One time I think he told me he would use a 37 device if there was one. <laughs> yeah, if, if there was one, absolutely, yes. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to take a quick uh, picture here uh, and then release this device. So you guys can go back to Henry Ford and see if, uh, see the end result of the CTO. Very, very nicely done. I think, I think all the techniques that you showed the audience are fantastic. But the biggest thing is be careful, be safe. Uh, and as a lot of talks have gone on between yesterday and today, you know, the appendage is a very thin wall structure. So as I was, was being exemplified right now is if you push that sheet a little too far out, uh, you can really have a catastrophe in your hands very quickly. So, Al Alec, one one more uh, question for you is: uh, now that this device looks perfect, how are you going to treat the patient? What anticoagulation strategy, duration, antiplatelet therapy? What's your plan? So yeah, uh, you know, I've typically uh, stopped uh, uh, stopped doing uh, like do the procedure while they are anticoagulated. Uh, uh, you know. For this case, I stopped it five days before, but uh, because of the life case. But uh, usually, I, I have been doing these uh, while they're anticoagulated. I don't stop them and continue. Uh, if they're on warfarin, I continue the warfarin till they get the 45-day TE. And uh, if they are on NOAX, I continue the NOAX too with an aspirin. And at 45 days, we do the TE. And if there's no thrombus or leaks around the device, we stop their uh, anticoagulation, and I put them on clopidogrel for up to six months. I, I mean, I do still follow the uh, the protocol that was done in the trials. I I will be curious to know what 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 the panel is doing these days. The bridge or the Jim, what do you think about doing uh, transeptal puncture on patients that are uh, still on um, eloquence therapy? You know, at our institute. We, we just continue it. We've kind of gone away from stopping it ahead of time. How about you guys? So you know what? Uh, maybe I'm a wimp, but I absolutely stopped the anticoagulation five days before if it's a NOAC 48 hours, depending on the GFR. Uh, and that's worked out well. I know more and more people are doing that now. They're not stopping. And I think from the, the EP world, that's what they've done. Uh, I personally just feel very uncomfortable doing it. Uh, Postoperatively, I think, I always tell my patients, on label, you have to go back on Coumadin. If you were on a NOAC, I ideally have to switch you. Uh, some people say it's okay, it's only 45 days, and they're willing to do it. Some people are not. So people who are not, uh, they are informed uh, of the fact that it should be Coumadin, but if they don't want it, that's perfectly fine. Uh, and you put them on NOAC for 45 days. W would you feel more comfortable, Bridge, if there was an active, reliable reversal agent that we routinely stocked in the hybrid lab? Uh, you know, I would. The only problem is every time I've asked for one, for Predacta, you know, the pharmacy guys completely have, you know, a, a conniption. A conniption? You know? they, they actually have a conniption? Have a conniption. Yeah, they actually will not give it to you. So, so right. in, in a situation when somebody starts bleeding and I need the antidote, right. and the pharmacist is, is having a fit, you know, that's a big problem. Yeah, we're there with IV Tylenol right now. I, re really the same thing. I agree. Yeah, I, you know, from uh, our program, we're more frequently now not stopping the warfarin, just making sure, you know, it's not an INR4 when they're coming in. And I tend to just stop the NOAC, NOAC a day before, sort of, uh, you know, a mini, a mini hold on it. And uh, I think with TE guidance, you know, knock on wood, the uh, issues with respect to trouble in the transeptal and perforation have gotten very low. What is your threshold for... Um not completing 45 days of anticoagulation, if there's any bleeding at all. Are you comfortable just moving straight to aspirin and Plavix if there's bleeding? Uh, yes. And, uh, you know, I, I, these patients who are almost, you know, contraindicated uh, uh, patients for anticoagulation, you know, we give some warfarin, but it's not like we're trying to be uh, terribly therapeutic with it. Um, and I have no hesitation just moving to dual antiplatelet therapy if they, if they bleed while they're on the anticoagulant. I think we've got good data from the ASAP registry that right. that's safe. Okay. You know, you know, it's, it's interesting, so I've done that too. Uh, so, but one, and one of the things that you've got to be careful time. about is if you're going to put these people on aspirin and plavix, and if they develop a thrombus, do platelet reactivity testing. Because I had one of my patients that was on 
assay and flavix and develop a thrombus, and lo and behold, uh, the assay was abnormal. We put it on prasugrel, and the, the, the thrombus went away. So, Herms and Steve, uh, in the real world, what percent of patients do you have on a NOAC? I know it's off-label, but uh, in the real world, Coumadin is the label choice, but what percent do you see? Now we're seeing it more and more. I would say at least uh, at least a third of the patients are on no access ahead of time. It might be even higher. It, may, it all depends on your your uh, territory and where the patients are coming from. If they come from basically EP referrals, there's a higher incidence of no of no act utilization. And um, you know, I personally like Eliquis a lot. It looks like the safest procedure. We have a lot of experience nice. of transeptal puncture on patients with Eliquis, and it's been very safe. Yeah, Mike, I mean, we, we generally switch them over to warfarin just because that's the label. Uh, but there are data, you know, we presented that yesterday, uh, you know, that it is safe to use a NOAC. I mean, it's small, non-randomized, kind of 300 patients, 250 patients in, in a NOAC versus the warfarin. And, and it looks safe to do, but I, I tend to just go on the label if possible. So I want to draw your attention one more time, and I think it's worth repeating. Could we come down and show the, the uh, access site? So there is a new labeling uh, for uh, using perclos uh, on the venous side of things. Uh, how many guys on the uh, panel are actively perclosing for venous sticks, for large bore venous sticks? We do it all the time. Yeah. I do it all the time also. It's, it's just so easy. It, you know, it almost, it, it, the success rate is so high for this. You know, I do, uh, for my mitra clip for sure, I do two uh, proglides and you know, a lot of the time just uh, do a figure of eight stitch. My friend here, Elok, would, you know, uh, pre-close a, a peripheral IV if he could. He loves this device, and he's extremely facile with it, and I think that's the key is, is getting comfortable with the device. So uh, we, we released the device. I'm going to ask Dr. Berg to see if there is any right-to-left shunt from it the transept. This is all left-to-right. We just took a look at that on the uh, color flow Doppler, so there's no right-to-left flow whatsoever. And this was our final uh, angio, and uh, and I think it looks pretty decent. Now, we're never going to cover those small anterior trabeculations, so I think this is as good as it's going to be. So uh, any final comments from the panel? You know, Alu, could you show the double curved sheet uh, to the audience? Can we see the double curved sheet, please? Mm -hmm. You want to put it over here? Go ahead and look. So, yeah, so this is a double curve sheath. And if you look at uh, right here, there's a, a small curve which goes a little bit uh, to the anterior side when you go from the posterior. And there are three sheaths. One is single curve. There's no curve on this, uh, on the single curve. This is a double curve. So one curve and then the second curve. And then there's an anterior curve which has a more anterior reach uh, for a chicken wing kind of anatomy. I, b I barely use the anterior uh, curve. Uh, I've only used it in like maybe like 5% of the cases, and most of my uh, implants are through the double curve sheet. So this would have been a perfect example if you did not get a good seal or if you had too much of an overhang with this patient. You may have wanted to use an anterior curve sheet. Absolutely. And have less of an overhang. Well, this, you did a fantastic job. You didn't need to, but that would have been a reason why yeah. you would have used that. David, I'll look. This, this has just been a fantastic demonstration, and we yep. really appreciate it. Well, let's, uh, uh, before we go to Henry Ford, I do want to say something. This is the third year Alok's done live cases uh, for Scott Snow Interventional Forum. The first year he did it was, you know, several years ago. He was a fellow, so he did the Watchman from Scripps with Matt Price sort of watching, sort of like I just did. Uh, as a as a uh, as an inter as a structural fellow, so he he's really doing a spectacular job, and I think he deserves a real round of applause. I think that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So we can go to Henry Ford. We'll cut out here, and uh, Herms, it's up to you. Why don't you guys decide if you want to go back to Henry Ford if uh, yeah. if uh, Cal wants to uh, show us what he's got? Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks, David. Uh, David thanks a thank lot. You. We're going to go back to Henry Ford. And, uh,